he gets a, a spirit of prophecy on him. Obviously, everything that da- David writes is inspired by the Lord. But there's times when David is writing, even about his own circumstances, and all of a sudden, God will lead him to write about the coming Messiah. I don't know if he even always even recognizes it. Because sometimes it has like a double application. It applies to himself, but it also applies to the Messiah. And even the very next chapter, Psalm 22, where we'll be, you know, Lord willing, next week or soon, that's the very famous psalm where it talks about Jesus or the Messiah being pierced and his, his clothing being, being, you know, lots being cast for his clothing. That's, David wrote that. And a lot of it applied to his own life, but there was parts that were specifically for the Messiah. Another one is um, Psalm 16, where it talks about, you won't let your Holy One see decay. Obviously, the, the Messiah, he wouldn't rot. He'd, he would r- arise to, to life. So tonight's Psalm, Psalm 21, is, there's prophecy in it. And I think that almost every single sentence in here not only has direct application to David, but also to the Messiah, which you're going to see. And, it, and of course it affects us tonight. It applies to us tonight. Lord, please speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me just grab one drink here. All right, Psalm 21, verse 1. O Lord, in your strength the king rejoices. And I'm going to stop a lot because sometimes we read stuff so quick, so fast that we don't, we miss a lot. There's so much in that one sentence. Oh Lord, in your strength, the king rejoices. David is writing. He is king at this point. And he's saying, Lord, my, my joy is in your strength. And even from a really young age, that was the heart of David. Because even when... You remember, of course, David and Goliath. Even when he went to go face Goliath and he first went to uh, his brothers that were fighting in, in Saul's army, and they're like, David, get out of here. This is not for you. You're just wanting to be cool. That's a paraphrase. And David told them, no, 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 look. When the lions used to come along and the bears and stuff, the, the Lord delivered them. You know, he delivered them into my hands. I killed them. The Lord gave me victory. He's going to give me victory with Goliath too. This is an uncircumcised Philistine who defies the armies of the living God. He had total trust and, and his joy was totally in the strength of God. And all throughout the Psalms, I mean, you can read, there are so many Psalms that say things like, Oh God, you are my strength, the strength of my heart. One of my favorites is Psalm 28. Uh, and I'm just going to read to you the verse. It's um, verse 7. He says, 28 verse 7, The Lord is my strength and my shield, and in Him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exults, rejoices, and with my song I give thanks to Him. Because David had his focus and his joy completely set on the strength of God, he was able to, to be helped, to rejoice. He even said, because I trust in your strength and in you as my strength, I'm helped. Instead of having, I have to do it myself, I have to work towards this, I trust in you. And as a result, this is my help. And for us, you know what? The hand of God, sometimes we have a tendency to focus and, and find our strength and our joy in our own hand, our own strength, instead of the hand of God. Sometimes, you know, we get good at something or maybe it's speaking, you know, like teaching the word or maybe it's evangelism or whatever it might be. And we begin sometimes, you know, Lord willing, I pray this doesn't happen to us anytime soon. But we begin to find our our comfort and our assurance in our own abilities and in our own strengths. And God is so careful that as soon as we do that, that He will make sure that while we're focused on our own arm of strength, that we will not see His arm of strength. That while we are so relying upon ourselves, we will not be able to see the Lord in all that He would like to do. Because He will not share His glory with anybody. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. He's not going to share His glory. God has so much for us, and especially being our strength, Him being our strength. He wants to fight for us. But we push him to the side and we, and we just insist that we can handle it. 
and we miss out. We would not be able to say like David, Lord, you're my strength and my heart trusts in you and I am helped. We can't say that if we're fighting and not relying upon the hand of God. And you know, Jesus, though he is completely God, he was completely man. And in the same way that David had his joy and his assurance in the strength of God, so did Jesus. How many times can you think of where Jesus would go off to a lonely mountainside and pray? Or get up early in the morning while it was still dark and, and pray? Or in the Garden of Gethsemane, before he's about to go to the cross and face the fierce wrath of God, he would go there and he would pray because he received strength from the Father. And, and he relied upon the Lord, his Father, to give him that strength. Everything that Jesus did was by the strength that God provided. So in your strength, the King rejoices, and in your salvation, how greatly he exults, which just means to rejoice greatly. Whenever David would experience some kind of salvation from the Lord, like victory over Saul, or the armies that are coming against him, or his son Absalom, or whoever else, he would rejoice. Because God just delivered him. That's something worth rejoicing over. Sometimes when God does something for us, we forget about it almost as quick as it happened. Like we've been praying for this for so long, it happens. Oh, cool. And then there's the next thing. Like for example, I, just be honest, you don't have to raise your hand, but like this building, we've been praying for a building for a while, right? And when you heard on Sunday that hey, the Lord provided a building, which now we know that He didn't, but when you heard that, how many of you were like, praise the Lord, and then that was it, and then you forgot, and you're like moving on. Maybe not everybody, but we have a tendency when God does something that has, that it's an answer to our prayer. He has delivered us, He has saved us, and I don't just mean like salvation, but salvation from whatever, man, we forget so quickly. Or on to the next problem. What? Children of Israel did that. So they did that over and over again. And you know what? It grieved the Lord. It, we had read that a few months ago, how when they were wandering and when they were out and about, uh, they would constantly, they, they would see God do something incredible, incredible. And then they would immediately, right after that, respond with, with uh, grumbling and complaining and, and doubting the Lord. David rejoiced in the salvation that uh, God had given to him. And you know what, Jesus? I, I could not help but think of this verse. It says in Hebrews that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the, of the Father. When it came to the salvation that God had ordained for, for mankind, Jesus looked at it, even though it was going to cost him everything, and he looked right, right on, head on, and he considered it pure joy. Why would he consider the, the nails and the whipping and the wrath of God as, as pure joy? Because of, of souls. Reconciliation between God and man. It gave him joy. This is what he came to do, was to reconcile us to God. So Jesus also rejoiced at his salvation. God saves us from stuff all the time on a daily basis. And whenever we see that, whenever we see God come to our rescue, we shouldn't just give a, a casual, thank you, Lord. We should rejoice. We should dance for joy at His deliverance in our lives. Verse 2, You have given Him His heart's desire and have not withheld the request of His lips. If you go back just one chapter, Psalm 20, this one we're reading tonight is in response to Psalm 20, at least partially. And if you just look, just the very first verse, May the Lord, here's their prayer, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May He send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. And then may go to verse 4, May He grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. That, that was their prayer. You know, we're facing an enemy, a, a real physical enemy. And Lord, would you please... Deliver us. And he did. And now David is, is looking back and he's saying, Man, Lord, you, you did give me the desire of my heart. You, you honored the request of my lips. And with Jesus, you know what? It's not very hard to figure out that the heart's desire of, of Jesus is, is reconciliation, is souls. We know that because in the Gospels it says, Jesus says, I have come to seek and to save the lost. And God gave that to him. God gave him 
11 true disciples that you know loved him even though they all abandoned him but they loved him God gave him many 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 more souls throughout his time but especially after he ascended into heaven and guess what us here tonight God gave us to Jesus we are by the grace of God here and in love with the Lord and forgiven of our sins because of the work of Jesus Christ because the Father drew us in the Father brought us in and saved us and cleansed us. That was, the, that was the heart's desire of Jesus, was us. And God gave it to him. And you know what? Right now, this very moment, and I don't understand it, but Jesus right now is, there are more requests on his lips because he is interceding daily for those of us who are, who are his children. He's interceding for us right now. He ever lives to make intercession for us. And there is no prayer that Jesus prays that the Father does not answer. Because he prays from a perfect heart. And he prays from perfect motives. And he pray, prays with perfect vision. And the Lord honors it. And we can know that right now, the Lord is praying for us. He's praying for you. Whatever it is that, <clears throat> that we face you know, tonight, this building, he's praying for us. The Lord is in control. And... He is on our side, or maybe we're on his side. Uh, verse 3, For you meet him with rich blessings. Notice, not just blessings, with rich blessings. And you set a crown of uh, fine gold upon his head. You know, the Lord, he blesses us all the time, you know, on a daily basis. But it's not just blessings. It's not just here and there, little itty-bitty things. I mean, he really does richly bless us. And I'm not talking about just salvation. I, I, think about the things in your life. Think about the ways that God has met you and provided for you. And like Mac and Tracy brought together, married, and I mean, you guys, two years, three years, however long ago, you wouldn't have guessed that. You were probably praying for your husband, for your wife. Anybody else, you know, uh, the Morgans, you guys moved into a house a while ago. I'm not sure how long ago that was, but you prayed and that was an answer to prayer. You know, things in your own life that like, you really sought after, that you uh, were really facing a very difficult situation, and God came. God came through and, and, and blessed you richly. <clears throat> I think, for me just recently, and I just can't get over it, because it, to me it's amazing, is that I've been praying for a car for a long time. <laughs> because we got a baby on the way, and baby can't go on the scooter. And, uh, and I've been praying, and my wife too has been praying, but especially me, because... I'm on a scooter. And so every time I'm on the scooter in the miserable sun and rain, I'm like, oh, Lord, please, please bring a car. And, you know, we've been trying to save. And, and so that costs money. A car costs money. It, you know, it's not easy. So we've been trying to save and be faithful, but we've been praying for God to provide one. And uh, just a couple weeks ago, it was only like maybe two weeks ago, if that... Uh, my grandpa, he's been looking too. He's really good with like looking for cars. He sent a, a good possibility over. The only problem was someone else had already offered a price on it. And it's a, it's a used car, so that we wanted to just pay for it and not have to make payments. And, uh, and a lady wanted me, if I was interested, to look at it that evening. Otherwise, it's just going to go to the other person. But that evening, we had an elders meeting here. And so I couldn't. And I was like, well, it's just not the Lord's will. And then I texted Scott when I was leaving work. Because I wanted to make sure I had the right time for the elders meeting because I couldn't remember if it was 7 or 8. And he's like, oh, it was canceled tonight. <laughs> so I was like, praise the Lord. And I went down and I went to the place where it was and, and looked at it. And I liked it a lot. I actually like it way better now, but I liked it a lot that night. And um, my wife couldn't come because we she was babysitting, but we talked about it. We looked at the pictures. My grandpa helped us with a couple of the technical things and um, just all that. And we... We agreed that it was the Lord's will, that this was a good idea, that it was, it was from the hand of God. And we went forward with it and got it. And uh, I met the lady at the title office in, in St. Pete the next day. And um, she's a lesbian. And when we got there, someone had thrown a cigarette onto a pile of mulch and caught on fire, so they evacuated the whole building. So her and I went outside, and we just spent 45 minutes out there. I got to share the whole gospel with her. It was such a good conversation, although, you know, she's obviously, you know, distant uh, from that. But she was still willing to talk. She couldn't go anywhere. I had her money. <laughs> and, uh, and you know what? 
that car has been to be such a blessing. It's got so few miles and it's just been a, a thing. The Lord didn't have to give that though. He could have given a junker. He could have given nothing. You know, no car. And you know what? Some of you might think, well, why are you? That's like a physical object. That's not really a blessing. Yes, it is. Everything's a blessing. You know what Paul said in 1 Corinthians, or one of those Corinthians, he said, what do you have, what do you have that you did not receive? from the Lord. What are you bragging about? You didn't, you didn't earn that. You didn't go and build that. You received it from the Lord. I was telling a co-worker just a couple of days ago who's not saved. They said, oh, nice car. And so we were talking about it. And I told them um, that, because I want to make it very clear, I told them that we had gotten it, used and you know, paid for it so we had to make payments on it. And he's like, that's good. I'm glad you guys were saving and whatnot. And I said, yeah, praise the Lord. But you know what? Even though it was our money that paid for it, that was a, it was a gift from God because God gave us jobs, you know. God gave us these paychecks, and God gave us the wisdom to save. Everything we have is a gift from God. Amen. Everything, and you know what, Jesus, He is the source of all God's blessings to us. Amen. Ephesians one, Paul said, "Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms." Everything that we have is. Jesus is the fountain of those blessings. It came through Jesus. Anything good comes from Him. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. And He has given them to us through Christ. Because that is our connection to the Father. So He doesn't just bless us. He richly blesses us. And you set a crown of fine gold upon His head. David was a king. And David was having victory over his enemies. You know, he literally wore a crown. And he was rejoicing over the position that God had put him in. He didn't earn that. He, didn't, he wasn't taking pride in it like, I'm better. He, he was just, Lord, you put me here. You put, I can't believe it. I was facing like thousands of armies and, uh, of men that hated you. And now here I am and I got this crown on my head. You put it here. And Jesus, you know what? Before he wore that crown of gold, he wore a crown of thorns. Jesus, that crown of gold, that, that heavenly you know, idea of a crown... That's always belonged to Jesus. That's Him. He's King. He's Lord of all. Way before the cross. He's Lord. He's Creator. And there is no other Creator. He is. And yet Jesus humbled Himself and took the nature of a servant being found in, in human likeness and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He didn't have to wear a crown of thorns. The, the crown of thorns, he could have worn a crown, a, a crown of gold, a heavenly gold, forever and never take it off. But he laid that aside. He laid aside his heavenly home. He laid aside his intimacy with the Father in order to be here where he would ultimately be forsaken by the Father on that cross as the wrath of God was poured out upon him. That's amazing. The love of our Savior for us. He wore a crown of thorns formed by wicked men's hands, men who hate him, men who spurn his name, men who spit on him, men in Hebrews it says, who trample the blood of the Son. And he wore it. He could have called down legions of angels to deliver him, but he didn't. He went forward. Verse 4, He asked life of you, and you gave it to him, length of days forever and ever. David asked for that. Lord, let me live. Don't let me perish right now. Let me live. Let me see the salvation of the Lord. And God gave it to him. Jesus. God gave him life everlasting. Again, he is God, so obviously he's everlasting. But God raised him from the dead, never to see death again. Jesus was resurrected and will never die again. He never had to in the first place, but he willingly gave up his life. And now his length of days are forever and ever. And those who put their trust in him, those who come to him, will also have length of days forever and ever. And I think even David had some sort of a sense of that immortality. I mean, he didn't have all the revelation that we have today. But what God had revealed to him, he knew that though it wasn't crystal clear, he knew that he would live forever, that he would be with the Lord, that this is not all there is to life. God answered him. And praise the Lord that we have length of days forever and ever with the Lord. Verse 5, His glory is great through your salvation. Splendor and majesty you bestow on Him. For David, I mean, he's got victory over his enemies, so he is above all these nations. You know, the splendor and majesty is because of his 
the victory that he has. The nations fear Israel. The nations fear because they see that God is with them. For Jesus, I think this is incredible, that God's glory is magnified through the sufferings of Jesus. When you look at that cross, which that's salvation. We're just reading right here. His glory is great through your salvation. You see the love of God on display. The glory of God on display. The power of God. The, the holiness of God is on display at the cross of Jesus Christ. Ephesians says that Jesus is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. and He's got the name that's above every name. And God has given him all things. All things are his. All things were created by him and for him. He is literally clothed with splendor and majesty. And like Rose had mentioned in worship tonight, holy, holy, holy. When Isaiah saw him seated on his throne, holy, holy, holy is what he, is what he said of, of Jesus. He is glorious. He is clothed with splendor and majesty and yet he's in this room with us tonight. And he dwells inside of us. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Or the temple of the living God through the Holy Spirit. He dwells inside of us. It blows my mind. Verse 6. You make him most blessed forever. Some translations say you make him the source of blessing forever. You make him glad with the joy of your presence. You know, Jesus, uh, when God, uh, I'll say it this way, when God met with Abraham back in Genesis, and revealed to him that through his seed would come the Messiah. He, what did he tell them? He, he told them, and all nations will be blessed because of you. This seed that would come through Abraham, that would come through David, David's part of that line, would be the Messiah who would bless us. And I love what Paul said, or Peter said in Acts. He said, um, God has blessed you by turning you from your wickedness. That's the blessing. Jesus, the source of all blessing, the greatest one of all, the greatest blessing of all, is that He would turn us from our wicked ways to, toward Him and that He would clothe us in His righteousness. You make Him most blessed forever and you make Him glad with the joy of your presence. Jesus was the man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. I mean, nobody else carried the wrath of God. Nobody else carried the burdens of, of men and women. Jesus was the only one, and yet he was still in the presence of the Lord, filled with joy. Psalm 16 says, in your presence is fullness of joy. Jesus, though he was the man of sorrows, he was the most joyful man on the earth, because he had that intimacy with the Father. And even David understood that. Even David had times in his life where, of course, he struggled and went through difficult times, but he would find that intimacy with the Lord and would rejoice. He would say, soul, why are you so downcast within me? Put your hope in God. I will yet rejoice. I will praise my Savior and my God. In His presence is the fullness of joy. That's how you get that joy, is in the presence of God. Jesus had unhindered intimacy, unhindered devotion, unhindered fellowship with the Father, which is why He was made glad with the joy of God's presence. For the king trusts in the Lord and through the steadfast love of the Most High he shall not be moved. For David, of course, he had to trust the Lord. He was facing impossible circumstances over and over again. And he would continually call on his soul to trust the Lord. And when he trusted him, he would not be moved. For Jesus, I love this verse, it says, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly when they had hurled their insults at him. He entrusted himself to God who judges justly. You know what? The Lord, as I had mentioned before, could have at any moment left the scene and just gone back home. He could have at any moment just given up, forget these people, they're ridiculous, they're just wicked, they're, they're, they're monsters. But he didn't. He trusted the Father the Father had ordained this plan of salvation from the foundations of the earth. And Jesus trusted Him and it was not moved. Verse 8, your, right, or your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. There's no one who's hidden, who's hidden from the Lord. There's no enemy of God that can hide 
when God judges the world. Nobody can hide from the living God. The Bible even says that it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. If you're not right with Him, it's a dreadful thing. No one can hide from the hand of God's wrath, which will come. You will make them, these are the lost, the enemies of God, as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow them up in His wrath and fire will consume them. That's a sad thought for you know, our co-workers and our neighbors and our, our loved ones and our friends. That That is the end. That is their end. If they don't repent and trust in the Lord, they are enemies of God. That might be offensive to say that, but that's what they are. That's what we were. Every one of us. But we were washed, sanctified, cleansed, made right with God. The Bible says that we were objects of wrath before the, the kindness and the love and the mercy of God appeared. We were objects of God's wrath. And that's our friends. That's our neighbors. That's why we should every day seek to find people that we can warn and that we can share the good news with. You know, they're all around us. You don't have to go looking that hard at all. They're everywhere. People everywhere are lost. There's a lot more lost people than there are saved people. And we know that because Jesus said, broad is the road that leads to destruction and many are on it. Narrow is the road that leads to life and few, few find it. We should be warning people that if they remain as enemies of God, dead in their sins, Their end is eternal destruction. And they cannot hide. They will be destroyed. Verse 10, You will destroy their descendants from the earth and their offspring from among the children of man. Everything they worked for, everything they built up in this life will be wiped out as well. There will be not even a remembrance of them. It is utter destruction. Verse 11, Though they plan evil against you, Though they deceive, devise mischief, they will not succeed. For you will put them to flight and you will aim at their faces with your bows. Uh, I love the scripture in Colossians that says, if the people, the rulers of Jesus' day had understood what they were doing, understood that this is Jesus, like the Messiah, who's going to rise to life, who's going to judge the living and the dead, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They devised mischief. They devised these plans, but they did not succeed. I wonder how shocked Satan and all of his spiritual, all of his demons were when Jesus rose from the dead. I wonder if they had this sense of victory when Jesus was killed on the cross. Like, we did it. We conquered him. I wonder if, what their reaction was when that stone was rolled away and when Jesus emerged risen and resurrected and glorious and Lord of all. for who, That's who He always was. Never just some man. Never someone that could be destroyed. Ever. He could never be destroyed. I wonder what the reaction was. They, des- they devised these evil plans but they didn't even come close to succeeding. People today, they devise plans to, to wipe out Christianity. Uh, and I don't mean like Kim Jong-un or whatever his name is in North Korea. I mean like your boss. Don't talk about the Lord in this, in this workplace. Don't you dare confront someone on their, on their uh, anger problem, on their sin problem, on their sexual addiction, on their drug addiction. Don't you dare call that sinful. Don't you dare mention repentance. I believe what I want to believe. You believe it. People want to wipe out Jesus. They want to wipe out the truth of, of God's word. And they'll devise ways, but they will not succeed. Verse 13. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. I just, we have just a couple of minutes. I just want to close with this. You know that in 2 Corinthians, you don't have to turn there. In 2 Corinthians... God, through the pen of Paul, gave us something that you can carry with you every single day, no matter what is going on, no matter what your enemies are, even if you're in a situation like David. And in this situation, of course, he was looking back and just praising God. But just one chapter prior, he was facing those enemies. Even there, 
or losing a job or some kind of horrible tragedy, God has given us something here that you can carry with you and you can run to and cling to and it is such an encouragement. And I'm just going to read it to you. It's from uh, the chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians. Paul says, but, and this is starting in verse 14, but thanks be to God who in Christ, now notice, it's in Christ and it's not in anything else. It's not good works. It's not your own spirituality. You know, by the way, if you ever see someone who's like, you consider to be strong in the Lord, like that right there, that girl, that guy, that he, that's an inspiration. That's an example. Man, he is on fire. Man, she is zealous. Whenever you meet someone like that, that you really esteem, and we should, when we find people like that, we should imitate them and follow their example, as Paul said. But we should never mistake whatever they've got for it being themselves. Like, that guy's just incredible. I mean, that guy's amazing. It's not that guy. If it was that guy, he would not be amazing. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. So recognize that. But thanks be to God who, in Christ, not in Jason Westerfield, Dan, I always mispronounce your last name, so I'm not going to try it. Uh, I've been saying Dan Varanelli for 15,000 years, but it's Varnelli. I want to correct everybody. It's Dan Varnelli. Crystal's shocked. Scott, yeah. <laughs> but it's not you guys, and it's not me, and it's not uh, whoever you look up to, whoever you're, you know, it's not Scott Rodriguez. It's Christ. So, but thanks be to God, who in Christ always, now that means every day, every night, every situation, every circumstance, every trial, always leads us in triumphal procession. Now look, you go to work tomorrow and you walk down your hallway of your, of your job, wherever that might be. Obviously, around you physically, there is no triumphal procession. There is no marching band and banners and dun 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 <laughs> There's none of that. But listen, this world is not even nearly as real as the spiritual world. Right. We live here, and this is all we know. I mean, physically, this is all we know. This, you know, physical, you know, stuff. But the spiritual world is far more real than this world. And it's far more intense than this world. I think if we could see some of the things spiritually, we would be terrified, or just we'd over, be overjoyed and just fall down dead. That's why when people see angels, they're terrified. They're not like, oh, I saw an angel yesterday. They're terrified, <laughs> usually. Uh, so when you go to work, you're not going to be led in the triumphal procession around you. But spiritually, everywhere you go, no matter what the circumstance is, you are walking in the victory of Jesus Christ. And the enemy has already been defeated. Your debt has already been paid. And there is no condemnation. And you're able to walk through work while you've got to face that mortgage payment and the guy who hates you and is always trying to put out Christianity. You've got to face all that. But yet you know in the face of those, man, I'm more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ who loved me and gave himself up for me. And you know what? Not, a, not, not just that. Not just that you go around and, and you're always in, walking in the victory of Jesus, but it's more than that. And through us, so through Trace, through Tiffany, through Virginia, especially Virginia. <laughs> the Lord uses Virginia. <laughs> through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. So as you're walking around here and there and all about, God, maybe you don't even realize it, but God is spreading the fragrance of the knowledge of Him. And it, sometimes without you even saying something, the way you act, the way that you respond to situations is a witness or not a witness. And it's spreading the knowledge of God. Someone looks at you while you handle this difficult situation and you're so at peace and you're so trusting the Lord and they're like, Wow, that guy knows God. I mean, he claims that all the time, but I can see it. He's spreading the knowledge of him. And most importantly, and you can never leave this out, most importantly, through our words. We have to share the gospel. You can't leave it up to your testimony alone. You cannot leave it up to just your witness. I'm a good worker. 
people are going to get saved. People are not going to look at your work ethic and be like, okay, from his work ethic, what I gather is I'm a wicked sinner. I'm headed for hell. <laughs> Jesus Christ went to the cross, died, and rose again. I must repent and trust in him because I watched him wash that car really well. That's not going to happen. And also, one more th- this is totally unrelated. Well, I mean, it's not unrelated, but I wasn't planning on sharing this, but you know that old qu- that quote, and I saw it on someone's t-shirt on Sunday, but they're not here today, so it's okay to mention it. It's not right, though. It says, uh, preach the gospel always, if necessary, use words. No, no, no. Preach the gospel always, and always use words, and always let your lifestyle, and always let your witness all together be a witness for Jesus Christ. Amen. We can't not use our mouth and, and testify. So through us, God is spreading the, the knowledge of the fragrance uh, of the knowledge of God. I'm sorry, the fragrance of the knowledge of God. Uh, among those, now there's a couple different people that it's among. Among those who are being saved, our brothers and sisters, our future brothers and sisters, and among those who are perishing, to the one, a fragrance from death to death. I wonder if you're able to guess which one that would be. The lost. And uh, to the other, a fragrance from life to life. So, we are this fragrance, and to those who are of God, to those that are His, it's the fragrance of life. They hear that message, they're like, oh man, that's, that is truth. I, 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 <clears throat> I bear witness to that. And to others, it's repulsive. It, it's, well, the cross of Christ is foolishness to those who are perishing. For, and then he closes by saying, Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God. In the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Listen, David, when he wrote Psalm 21, he was reflecting back on Psalm 20, on that experience. And he was rejoicing at the victory God gave him. And he was rejoicing that God not only heard his prayer, not only heard his heart's desire, but answered. He was rejoicing that God had crowned him, that God had put him and and God's people, Israel, above all other nations, above all other nations ever. He was rejoicing that he knew God was going to destroy his enemies, the enemies of God. And he wanted to exalt and just sing praise to the Lord. And at the same time, all of those things are the heart of Jesus. You can see that. That's the heart of Jesus. That he had such an intimacy with his Father. He relied upon him for strength. That the Father gave him his heart's desire. He planted it within him, these souls, and gave him his heart's desire. He, he did not withhold the request of his lips. The, the Father crowned him with glory and honor. And, and even though he gave it up for a, a short time to wear this crown of thorns, he is exalted and he's above every name and every knee that, that exists every person will bow in heaven and on the earth and under the earth he's got the name above all names forever and that Jesus himself will destroy the enemies of God he is the judge of the living and the dead we can take that because it applies so much to us through our days and we can know that as we walk wherever we go that we are because we are in Christ always being led in triumphal procession. We can walk like David, who just had all those enemies conquered. He walks, he's so confident, he's so excited, he's so joyful, he's so filled with wonder of God, the wonder of God. We can do that because our enemy's been defeated. We can be continually walking in, this, in, in the sense of fresh victory, as if it just happened, as if Jesus just rose from the dead yesterday and he's coming back tomorrow. We can walk in that. We're always being led in triumphal procession. No matter what the circumstance is, Jesus still won. We're still his children. And there's still now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And if we rejoice and we walk in that victory, the knowledge of God will be spread through us. How can it not? How can it not through a person who's filled with joy and filled with the wonder of God? And Lord, we pray that for ourselves, that we would walk in Well, we are walking in the victory of Jesus Christ, no matter how we feel, but that we would understand that we're walking in the victory of Jesus Christ. You said so many times through your word, Lord, for example, with Paul, I I do the things I don't want to do. I don't do the things that I do want to do. Who will rescue me from this wretched body? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is the victory. 
We have victory over sin through Jesus. We have victory over condemnation that the enemy comes along and accuses us. We have victory in Jesus. We have victory over our fears because God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love and power and a sound mind, Lord. We can rejoice in the victories that you've given to us. We have victory over sin and death. We will not be condemned. We will not perish. And we will not see the wrath of God on ourselves. We have tasted and seen that you are good, Lord, and we know that you will continue your faithfulness to us forevermore. And that like David, like the other men and women of God, we will have length of days forever and ever. And we pray, Lord, that as we leave here tonight, that we would always in our mind be aware of the triumphal procession that we are walking in because of the victory of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your victory, Lord. Thank you for your work on the cross. Thank you for your resurrection. And thank you for being with us tonight, for loving us tonight. We give you all the glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lord bless you guys. Good job.